Let's consider an example then. So we have a transmission line that is terminated by a load. A load has a real value of 125 ohms. And, and of course, this is purely real. There's no imaginary component for this particular load. We have a source whose source impedance, again, is purely real with a value of 20 ohms. We have a transmission line of characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. And it has a physical length of lambda over 4. So it would have an uh, electrical length of pi over 2 radians. All right, we know for some reason that the incident power uh, um, or the power associated with the incident wave uh, has a value of 0.49 joules per second, that uh, 490 millijoules per second is um, uh, associated with the wave that is propagating down toward this load, incident on this load. What we don't know about this problem is the uh, value of the open circuit source voltage, Vg. And the problem statement asks us to determine the magnitude of the value Vg, not the value Vg itself. We'll show later that value is not knowable, but we can determine the magnitude of this open circuit um, voltage Vg. Again, this value Vg is a complex value describing the, uh, um, the time harmonic oscillation of this source, both magnitude and relative phase. <laughs> Perhaps the most important thing to realize about this problem is that it is not a boundary condition problem. It is not a problem where we need to determine the total voltage or total current. We don't need to really determine any uh, complex values of, uh, of any form. Um, we, uh, it's you know, really kind of an academic problem here. For some reason, we know what the incident power is. And so this is a problem where we're going to use our relationships of the uh, uh, power, the different kinds of power of a transmission line, delivered, absorbed, uh, net, incident, and uh, reflected. And from that, we can determine the answer to the question, which is the magnitude of VG. Notice we're not trying to find the complex value VG, simply the real value, which is the magnitude. And of course, um, that we can determine from uh, uh, knowledge of uh, energy, rate of energy flow. So let's see how we do that. Anytime we try to solve a problem, uh, instead of going through and saying, well, gee, how do I find the magnitude of VG? Again, the important thing is simply ask ourselves, what else do I know given the problem statement? Don't try to figure out what the problem is asking for. Try to start at the beginning and say, what is the problem telling us? And what else can we determine from that knowledge? What is the next step uh, from the original problem statement? Well, if we look at this, we know that the incident power in this case, as we said, were 0.49 watts. We're 0.49 joules per second. And that is the incident power, the power that's incident on a load. And right away we say, okay, here's something that we know. If I know that the, the incident power on some specific load uh, attached to a transmission line of some specific characteristic impedance, from that we can determine right away the reflected power from that load. So let's go through and do that. So the relationship between the reflected power and the incident power, which is given in this problem, is simply uh, uh, the, the, the ratio of the two is simply the magnitude squared of the load reflection coefficient gamma L. Of course, we know what that load reflection coefficient is, uh, ZL minus Z0, ZL divided by ZL plus Z0. We put in the requisite numbers for this circuit, and we get a value of gamma L of 3 sevenths. We take the magnitude squared of that, and of course, within and we get and multiply it by 0.49, the incident power, and this provides us with the reflected power. So immediately we can take the incident power and uh, determine the reflected power. Again, oftentimes students who struggle with these problems, you know, I uh, um, I ask them, you know, why didn't you? Uh, what do you do with the incident power? And they're like, well, I don't know how to take the incident power and determine the magnitude of Vg. Don't worry about how you take the incident power or what's given you in the problem and try to figure out the answer. Take the statements that are given to you in a problem and just figure out what else can I determine? What else can I um, um, ascertain or calculate from uh, the statements that are given me in the problem statement? And you keep adding to your knowledge. And eventually, as you add to your knowledge, you realize, oh, wait, I have enough knowledge now to solve for the value that the problem is asking for. So in this case, again, we take the incident power. We have a load at the end of the transmission line. We can get gamma L. And right away, we know what the value of the reflected way 
wave is as well. So now we know incident reflected power. Again, how do we determine the magnitude of VG from that? I don't know. Let's keep going and see what else we can figure out. Of course, if we know the value of the uh, uh, power associate, associated with the wave incident on the load, the uh, incident power, and we know the reflected power from that load, the difference between the two is the net power flow along our transmission line. And of course, if we know the net power flow, we know two more things. We know what the absorbed power is, the power absorbed by the load at the very end of the line. And that difference between incident and reflector turns out to be 0.4 joules per second, 4.4 watts. Likewise, by conservation of energy, we know the power that's delivered by the source. It's equal to the power absorbed at the end since the transmission line is lossless. Both of those are equal to the net power flow of 0.4 and so likewise the delivered power is 0.4 watts. The delivered power is 0.4 watts, the net power is 0.4 watts, and the absorbed power is 0.4 watts. All those values are the difference between the incident power and the reflected power. So here is the uh, probably the most difficult part of the problem, or at least the most difficult conceptually. Uh, we know what the power now uh, being delivered by the source is. We know the rate at which the source is delivering power. But what we want to know is what is the magnitude of the open circuit voltage of that source. If I know that the source delivers power at a rate of 400 millijoules per second, uh, and I know its source impedance, how can I determine the value uh, or the magnitude of Vg? Well, the way we determine that is to come up with an equivalent circuit. And in this case, uh, the equivalent circuit, again, we're going to go through and uh, take the um, everything to the right of this plane and come up with the equivalent circuit, the input impedance uh, of this structure. And once we do that, then we have this equivalent circuit. And now we ask ourselves, if I know that the source is delivering power at the rate of 0.4 joules per second, or in other words, I know that this input impedance is absorbing um, uh, power at a rate of 0.4 joules per second. All right, I know how much this is absorbing. I know this value. If I know Zn, under that condition, I can determine the magnitude of Vg. So let's see how we might do that. The first problem, of course, is what is the value of this input impedance? Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Before we get determine the value of the input impedance, I just want to show that we can relate now uh, the power delivered by the source to the magnitude or the value of Vg. So we know that the power delivered by this source is going to be equal to Vn times the complex conjugate of In, take the real part and divide by 2. Again, from the circuit, we can determine the input current and we can determine the input voltage. And we insert both of these in there and that is our delivered power. And notice that relationship will depend then on this unknown value or Vg or more specifically, as we'll see, the magnitude of that uh, unknown value uh, Vg. But again, the question is, how do we determine the input impedance Zn? The uh, length of our transmission line is an impedance transformer that transforms the load of 125 ohms into some input uh, impedance. And uh, how do we determine that input impedance? That's the question that we have. How do we determine uh, Zn? Well, we could use a Smith chart perhaps to go through and uh, uh, take this value and rotate along clockwise around the Smith chart to determine what the input impedance is. We could take our input impedance expression or equation and insert this ZL in there and Z0 and beta L and so forth and do a lot of math. All right, we could do that. But in this case, we can get the answer very quickly indeed because we recognize the length of our transmission line is one of our special cases. This transmission line happens to have a length of lambda over four, electrical length of uh, beta L equal to uh, pi over two. And um, this will allow us to determine the uh, input uh, impedance directly because we know the expression for input impedance for this particular special case. Now, you may roll your eyes and say, well, this is simply a, a silly academic problem. But once again, the value, this links of transmission line of lambda over four show up over and over again in microwave engineering. It is a fundamental length that shows up in many, many structures of useful microwave circuits. So it, uh, even though it makes things easier and makes things quicker, it is a value that shows up sort of naturally in our uh, analysis of circuit design.
This is our quarter wave formula then, the input impedance uh, for a quarter wave length of transmission line. The quarter wave length of transmission line transforms a load impedance to an input impedance of this value. We simply take the char characteristic impedance of the transmission line and square it, that's in the numerator, divide by ZL, and that becomes our input impedance. Since ZL is purely real, this, uh, this, ex this expression is very easily determined, and it is a value of 20 ohms. Since we know Z is 20 ohms, we can go back and determine the input current, uh, the current into the uh, input impedance or the current coming out of the source, and it's VG over four, 40. rather. Notice it's in terms of this unknown value VG. Likewise, we have VN, the input voltage, <coughs> is going to be VG over two. So now that we have IN and VN, we can determine the rate at which the source is delivering energy. We then take then the value of VN, VG over two, and the complex conjugate of IN, VG over uh, 40. Notice that we take the complex conjugate of VG. There's no reason to believe that the value of VG would be a real value. It is a complex number, so we need to take the complex conjugate of VG here. And then we multiply these two things together. Of course, VG times its complex conjugate is the magnitude squared of that open circuit voltage. We take the real part, the magnitude, of course, squared is a real value, and 80 is a real value. So the real part of this is simply VG divided, VG magnitude of VG squared, rather, divided by 80. So uh, multiply that by one half, and we get this result. The power delivered in terms of the magnitude of VG, not in terms of VG, in terms of its magnitude. Now we know what the power delivered is. We calculate that earlier. It's the difference between the incident power and the reflected power, and we determine that to be 0.4 watts. And so this expression is equal to 0.4, and we can use that to solve explicitly for the magnitude of VG. If we do, this is the result we get. V, the magnitude of VG is the square root of 160 times the power delivered, which is 0.4, and therefore the magnitude of VG is a, equal to 8 volts. Now, this is the correct answer. We should stop at this point, but oftentimes students will go further and take an answer that's perfectly correct and create it, and from that, uh, create an answer which is perfectly incorrect. And let's see how a student might do that. Frequently, then, I get an answer that says the magnitude of VG is equal to 8 or something like that. And then the student will say, well, if the magnitude of VG is equal to 8 volts, then clearly VG is equal to 8 volts. And, of course, we can't say that. Sure, the magnitude of VG is equal to 8 is uh, uh, equal to 8, but the opposite is not true. There are lots of values of VG who have a magnitude of 8 volts. Remember, VG is a complex number. There are lots of complex numbers whose magnitude is equal to 8. The knowledge of the magnitude by itself uh, is not sufficient uh, to determine the value of VG, and certainly we cannot argue that it is equal to 8. Sometimes students will then go further and say, well, okay, VG is either plus or minus 8. Well, again, if VG were a known to be a real value, we could take the uh, expression that the absolute value of VG is equal to 8 and from that conclude that VG must be plus or minus 8. But again, there's no reason to believe that VG would be a real value. It is a complex number. We can't say it's plus or minus 8. This voltage, open circuit voltage, is a complex number, and therefore we can represent it in this way. It's the magnitude of that complex number times e to the j phi, where that is the phase of that complex number. We know the magnitude is equal to 8, so we know Vg we can write in this form, 8 times e to the j phi. What is the value of this phase that we have here? Well, we don't know. There's no way to know. From this problem. The only thing we can determine from this problem is the magnitude of this open circuit voltage VG, and we have, and it's equal to 8, and we need to stop there and not try to determine anything further uh, uh, about the value of VG. Again, a complex number has a magnitude and the phase. Once we know the magnitude, it doesn't tell us anything about the phase, just like knowledge of the phase doesn't tell us anything about the magnitude. They're independent values.